we will next end as our last talk of today have a short like lightning talk uh, which by uh, by Malte and Jeff which will basically give um, like a making off of the badges that you uh, all wear and hopefully have, have fun with it I already uh, observed lots of people um, with funny name tags and games and uh, <coughs> blinking blinking light um, patterns and stuff like that. So obviously, at least some of you have had some fun with it, and now um, let's see how those guys have uh, have done it. Welcome. Okay, so. Welcome to our talk, um, how we made a batch before you showed up. Um, first to our agenda, first we're gonna introduce ourselves. Uh, who are we, who, who built this batch you're all wearing today? Um, what goals did we have in mind when we started developing the batch? How did we uh, try to or even achieve these goals? And then some lessons learned and some secrets we promised you in the end. So first of all, who are we? So this is Jeff. Uh, he works normally as an electronic engineer, wearing funny hats that spit fire. Um, <laughs> he sleeps sometimes uh, and has a burning hat, as I already mentioned. Maybe some of you already saw this hat in action on some other conferences. We can't use it now, but maybe later outside. Uh, yeah, and Jeff likes to build stuff, like the badge or the hat. And he fixes the hardware he usually tries to fuck up before. <laughs> This is Malta. He's a uh, computer science student and uh, even more uh, a talented hacker. Uh, he sleeps uh, less than me, uh, which is why your patch has so many features. Uh, he has no burning hat and likes to build uh, more soft things um, and is usually blaming me for the hardware that's not working that's preventing him from building the things that he wishes to build. Yeah, so for the badge, you all saw the badge, you all have a badge. Um, the first thing, it works. We're pretty happy that we have a working badge. Uh, we were working hard on this to achieve this goal. Um, it also arrived very early this year, um, which was fortunate because we still had the time to uh, flash them again, just for some nostalgia, uh, to, to have this feeling of uh, last minute fixes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even though it was more like a perfectionism problem with this time. It's just so, not the same otherwise. Yeah. It? I mean, you have to fix the badge in, or at least flash the badge just before you need it. So what goals did we have in mind? First of all, we needed something that works. And we want, to, uh, we want you to have fun while using the, <coughs> the, the badge. And we can't tell if you have fun using it, but... That's something you can feedback uh, to us. We already got some feedback. Uh, that was pretty good. So thanks for this. <laughs> and yeah. You should uh, also show your name. That's an important part that sometimes uh, we forget. Uh, it should be interactive. And yeah, during this uh, being interactive um, offers you like a playground. Um, maybe you've already seen on the co uh, conference page that um, you can build your own apps for the badge and flash them on there or write them on there. Um, we will cover this uh, later on uh, how we like achieve this. Yeah, and yeah, we really wanted something that could live on uh, after the con uh, as easily as possible. Something that uh, doesn't just become uh, desktop uh, e-waste, more something that you can maybe code on when you feel like it after the after you've recovered. Yeah, and we also thought about a useful feature to show the agenda, so you don't have to like get out your phone and, and check the, the conference page, but just open the application on, on your badge uh, to, to look what, what talks are up next. There might even be more than one agenda, I don't know. Yeah, maybe some different conference sneaked in another agenda. Uh, maybe some of you saw the, the signs at the elevators already. But yeah, so how did we achieve these goals? So we, uh, we chose the uh, ESP32 platform uh, for a few reasons. It's uh, it supports many different languages. People are coding for it in uh, C, of course, but also Lua um, and uh, Python. Python. Uh, it's uh, got a pretty big community around it, which makes up for occasionally crappy documentation. You can uh, post and maybe someone will answer why the shit isn't working. Uh, 
fairly affordable too. It's got a lot of features in there, including um, stuff that we're not even using yet, like Bluetooth and uh, various sensors. So yeah, some room yeah. to grow. And yeah, and this affordability allows you, for example, to grab, grab another ESP and build something which connects those two, and you have a batch and maybe a server or something. Uh, and to, to achieve this, so, so that you can easily develop something for your batch, we chose MicroPython, which is a um, yeah, customized uh, Cython distribution for the batch that implements the, the hardware features um, into, into Python. And we chose Python because most people, or I have the feeling that Python is one of the easiest languages to learn and to, to code in. Even if you're not like uh, a developer, but just writing some code, you have like some technical knowledge, and you can easily write an application. Um, I, I heard that my code seems to be hard to understand for some people. Uh, there will be uh, like a, a documentation for it available uh, in the blog post on the Insinuator later, hopefully. <laughs> but at least the source code will be somewhere. So uh, <laughs> we hope that you can have a, like a rapid development process and do something with the batch. Uh, cool, so obviously it's got a neat paper display, which you've probably already noticed, uh, which is great, it means that the battery will last uh, a long time. Uh, and your battery has uh, arrived with you at 70% charge, by the way, so you'll actually, once you charge them, they'll last even longer. Uh, that's for the safety shipping regulations. Um, gives you amazing contrast, and you can use it outdoors, but obviously there's a bit of a slow refresh rate. But this particular module has a... Uh, a uh, selective redrawing function, so it's not actually too bad. You can code some things that you might not have thought possible by using that feature. Yeah, and uh, we also included a full QWERTY keyboard, so at least all characters are there. And there are some, some special uh, characters you can access through combinations with uh, some special buttons. Um, you might have noticed as well that when entering text, uh, you will see that it seems laggy or slow if you type a a letter, then it takes some time for it to register another character. This is actually not due to the, the ESP being slow or the, the MicroPython implementation, but actually um, when when I update the display or when the code updates the display, um, the code must wait for the for the update to finish before we can push the, the next image on it. Um, so basically there's a sleep that waits for the display to tell the ESP module, okay, I'm ready, send me the next end. This is what, <laughs> yeah, this is what introduces this latency. Um, yeah, but uh, therefore we have the, the battery saving and better contrast. Um, so we actually added another uh, feature, the accelerometer, which was kind of suggested by Wojtek um, because he wanted to build a Magic 8-Ball app. Maybe you already played around with that and had some great fun with, for example, the penetration test mode. Um, <laughs> and you can even use it for, for counting steps. Um, sadly, not in the background, but that's, this is due to like battery saving and battery life constraints. So uh, we decided to have only um, the, the step counter active while you, you're in the step counting app. So if anyone does the 10K run, we want to see how many steps you've taken. <laughs> Make sure you take your badge. Take yeah, <laughs> maybe you should use some tape to secure it while running. <laughs> the USB-C or the USB connectors are quite tough, but maybe not for running 10K. <laughs> it's also not waterproof. Uh, we also have the shitty add-on interface, which uh, you may not be familiar with. Um, it's a, uh, a badge to daughterboard uh, interface that's becoming popular. I think it grew out of DEF CON, the whole kind of uh, badge life uh, um, hashtag meme movement. Um, but hopefully, uh, if you've got any shitty add-ons at home, or if you gather them up in the future, they should all be compatible with your badge. It's essentially I squared C with uh, some power supply attached, and uh, it's quite enough to have some fun. And obviously, the uh, Fuchs add-on is available for soldering downstairs for whoever hasn't done the soldering workshop yet. Yeah, and make sure to take the one we fixed, <laughs> yeah. uh, and not the one with only one eye because the other one has uh, copper inside. Yeah, I, d I did the most <laughs> obvious uh, fuck up possible on the simplest board I think I've ever created. Uh, so if anyone wants a non-operating Fuchs PCB, we've got 350 of them lying around. <laughs> uh, some well, creative use would be nice. Well, you got one eye, and the other one is like, maybe you can see that there's an LED behind. <laughs> okay, so that leads us to the next section. What lessons did we learn? Um, so for the hardware, hardware side, 
Maybe Jeff. This was uh, <laughs> this was a series of lessons that I failed to learn and then relearn. Uh, first, we we saw some uh, boards that seemed to not program, or they would program the checksum wouldn't pass correctly, or they seemed to be gradually getting worse and worse. Uh, it turned out that inside the uh, ESP32 module, there's the flash chip, and it's a 1.8 volt flash chip, and uh, it's possible to boot the uh, ESP in a mode where it's uh, blasting the flash chip with a 3.3 volt supply. Uh, turn, turns out that more voltage is uh, not more better. And, uh, <laughs> does, doesn't make the flash chip work any better. Uh, yeah. So that was the first revision of the bed. Also, there's a bunch of uh, extra pins on the chip that are um, reserved. So one interesting feature of the ESP32 is that it's really flexible as to which peripherals inside the chip can be connected to which I.O. pins. Um, so that, that's quite good, but it sort of lulls you into the sense of false security. Uh, and maybe, well, maybe I should have checked it more carefully. Some of these I.O. pins aren't actually I.O. pins. They might be input only. So uh, yeah, input only, that means no output, right? So you can't use that to drive the I squared C bus. So the first badge uh, revision uh, had the ESP up, but none of the uh, I squared C peripherals would work, like the keyboard. Yeah, and it, I like couldn't even flash on, after, so. after some, oh, yeah. some flash circles. Yeah. Uh, so this was revision one, uh, but obviously uh, we reported these issues to Jeff, and yeah. Jeff thought down. about them, write, uh, wrote them down the very, yeah, very carefully. And then we got revision two. Uh, I, I used, created exactly the same problem again, uh, using the same input only pins for a slightly different application, but still output. Um, so yeah, revision two also didn't work without some serious hacking uh, manually. Um, we also discovered the weirdness of some Chinese part numbers around the whole like intelligent LED world. To, uh, well, it turns out the WF2812B is not really related to the WF2812 at all, and it's actually another chip, and blah, blah. So uh, yeah. that, was, that was some more learning. So, so, so the problem is, if you Google for such LEDs that you can, like RGB LEDs you can uh, chain up, you will most probably find something about the WS2812. So everybody that uses such LEDs will Google for WS2812. So what the Chinese manufacturer did, they actually took the SK6812, which is fairly identical, but not complete. Like um, the yeah, itself. from the timings and the, the supply voltage and um, how you have to drive the, the data in um, according to the, the um, input voltage, and just relabeled them as WS2812B minis, which <laughs> do not exist uh, in... So mini yeah. is short for doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> The way you'd expect, at least. So just remember that. Um, and, don't, and we also had a, we just about fixed this problem in software. Uh, and then production began two, three days later. Uh, and suddenly, uh, some of the LEDs, most of the LEDs weren't working. And some worked, some didn't, some worked on some boards. And so I was pretty convinced it was software. Mouser was pretty convinced it was hardware. Uh, <laughs> but actually, both of us were wrong. It was actually the factory uh, overcooking the LEDs. So uh, if you are rework, if you're, if you're reflowing, uh, if you're going through a standard uh, um, you know, industrial approach for fabricating your boards with those types of LEDs, then we recommend like baking them really thoroughly so they're really dry, because otherwise they absorb water. Uh, and maybe if you can possibly avoid it, um, don't pass them through the oven twice, just do it the once. So do the top side or the bottom side of your board in the right way. Yeah. We fix that. What else did we learn? Yeah, we also learned that uh, Jeff needs to yeah. check the footprints before he puts holes into the PCB and <laughs> order some some uh, connectors. Yeah, so you probably learned this like the first board you ever create, right? And I've uh, now been doing harder engineering for about fifteen years, and I still do <laughs> the exact same problem. So uh, just just check every footprint, um, and uh, yeah, we probably took. Uh, I spread myself too thin repairing a million broken boards, so I think next time I would create maybe two or three, get them just perfect, you know, before you try and fix the other ones. Um, and yeah, I got a bit lazy with my solder paste stenciling as well, so I would say be put pay pay really careful attention to detail in the yield of your prototype boards, um, because if you are putting together five boards by hand and they're quite complicated like these ones. There's a lot of potential uh, for 
each of those boards to develop a different problem. Uh, and so, yeah, if you've got the time, maybe try and make one at a time rather than doing a huge batch. Uh, and if you, as I noticed, my solder paste stenciling wasn't perfect, but it was 9 p.m. and I had to ship the boards to Melsa the next morning, so I thought, ah, screw it, it'll be fine. <laughs> but this is the wrong approach. Spend that extra 20 minutes, clean it off, put it back on, get it perfect, and uh, I won't do that again, I hope. Yeah, so that's what we learned hardware-wise, software-wise. Uh, I did learn something. For example, don't trust the MicroPython documentation. There is a documentation available, uh, but MicroPython started for, I think it was the Pi board, maybe. Yeah. So there's one board they started with, and then they ported the, the MicroPython uh, firmware to different ports, uh, boards. And at the beginning, they had different repositories for each port. Um, then they realized that's a lot of copied code, so we can merge this into one uh, common uh, repository. But they still had the documentation. <coughs> sorry, uh, they still had the documentation um, split up for each port. And they so like when I was starting, it was still split up um, documentations for different ports, and it wasn't even clear. So some functions were not uh, not um, documented at all. And in the end, while I was like finishing everything up, um, they actually merged the documentations of all ports into one documentation. Um, with the result that there were functions documented which didn't exist in the ESP port. So um, it was really pain to develop something, then go through the whole menu to the uh, part you just developed, uh, just to realize that the function doesn't exist. So um, I went over to, because I was um, also writing uh, some modules, for example, the display module in, in C as a Cython module or a MicroPython uh, module using their, their C macros. Um, so I was like familiar with how to or how to define and expose functions from C to the to the MicroPython. Um, so it was fairly easy for me to check which functions and which constants are actually exposed by the code instead of looking for working documentation. Uh, and to ruin the fun of reflashing 500 badges, um, you could implement OTA updates for the whole firmware, not only for the applications, because currently if you reset your batch and it goes uh, turns on, it will try to connect to the um, provisioning or update server and checks if there are application updates, but not for the firmware. So this is still hard flashed on, onto, the, onto the flash or onto the chip. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> what do you realize? Oh, normally if you develop Python on a desktop computer, you're like, maybe having like uh, quad core and like four gigahertz and maybe 16 gigs of RAM. But if you're limited to 128 uh, kilobytes of, of RAM, this is quite uh, interesting to, to optimize because if you create an integer in, in Python, that's around 30 or 36 bytes, like one integer. If you, if you create one string, uh, so an empty string, it's like 40 or 42 bytes. But um, if you add one char to that string, that's only one more byte. Um, but if you want to, for example, let's say, um, render the, the, the image on the display, that's like 296 by 128 pixels uh, divided by eight because actually one pixel is only one bit. Uh, so you can pack them into, into bytes. Uh, that's still about 3,000 something um, byte. And if you have an array of 3,000 um, integers in, in the Python, this will explode on such a platform, which is no problem on, on your desktop, I guess. Uh, but uh, like coding in, in C for Python and really optimizing the code really taught me a lot about how uh, Python works internally and yeah. And over engineering is fun. Uh, I was like, I was kind of blocked by Jeff <laughs> because I got a revision one, which I couldn't work on or continue work on. I got a revision two that had the hardware features missing I need to implement for. So I was like, what should I do with my time? So I implemented. This is deliberate, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I implemented a lot of stuff that is not really used. For example, um, the the um, frame buffer for the for the display driver actually supports rotations by 0, 90, 180, and 270 degrees. But the the only option we're using is uh, 90 or 270 degrees because the display would normally be oriented like this. So we changed this to better display a name. 
Um, but I, I thought when I'm currently at it, why not add like different rotation modes? Maybe I will need them later. And <laughs> exactly. And so after I was kind of finished with everything, so the provisioning server, um, the authentication of the badges and all the applications or uh, many of the applications, Jeff came and he was at Hacker Hotel, was it? Yes. Yeah, Hacker yeah. Hotel. Yeah. And uh, he met some guys from the, the batch team. Uh, that actually built the framework for the SHA 2017 badge and they like built a, a framework so you can have like support for your badges after the conference ends and have like shared applications between those conferences or bring your old badges and this could be compatible with the uh, with the other one um, but everything was already finished and I was like I don't want to change now but for the next time this might be interesting to um, help building like a common platform for conference hardware and badges. So if you're going to be at uh, Troopers uh, 20, maybe you, you might <laughs> want to have a look at badge.team, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, then we have some general lessons, especially for Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, um, I learned a lot about UPS, uh, shipping packages from UPS to Germany, like the latency between uh, yeah, basically uh, in the UK, DHL is total crap and UPS are really good. And then in Germany, uh, same way around, DHL are sort of okay and, and UPS are, are really chill, terrible. So, um, yeah, shipping, what, what to do, right, to get efficient packages back and forth. And one day I was just running like crazy to the UPS counter to hand over the package and then just hit the ground face first and uh, <laughs> cracked open my knee. So I've, I've, I've shed serious blood into this project. Um, and then, yeah, latency, uh, working between different countries and, uh, and Skype and so on. But I think we did a pretty decent job. Um, the uh, Also, you've probably heard this before, that hardware design during uh, Chinese New Year is pretty tough. Uh, we knew that this was going to be tough, um, but perhaps not exactly how tough. And you've got to be really uh, tactical about uh, when to schedule uh, manufacturing time uh, on a production line. and. Uh, even we had no plans to actually do it in China, but simply the existence of Chinese New Year basically pushes a lot more manufacturing back into the West for those months. And so where we normally expect to get uh, time in the production lines in England, uh, that was suddenly not available to us. So that caused some uh, interesting problems. And essentially, we ended up using a prototype PCB service rather than like a full production PCB prototype uh, PCB service, which made everything a lot more expensive and error prone. So yeah, try and avoid that if you can. Yeah. Then for the promised writing apps, there are some instructions already up on the conference page on slash batch, uh, but there will be a blog post on the insinuator. So if you're interested in building your own applications or extending existing applications, um, you can take a look at the source code that's already on your batches um, or just uh, check insinuator um, in the next time and there will be a very detailed description and source code on how to how to build something new with this uh, framework. So um, for a last point, as you were promised secrets, there are some combinations you can try through the, the batch applications. Um, so the the guy on the right is actually Nowhere, or one Nowhere, because there's a whole conference of Nowheres. <laughs> We can even put the slides up on the, or maybe this slide on the uh, conference page so you don't have to uh, take a photo now. Um, but yeah, so there might be some interesting interactions. Some of you already figured out the first one I, I see. And uh, that's a Konami code. And this works, for example, in the name app to show this beautiful rainbow animation. And then for the end, happy now, Wilcon. <laughs>